This is a 58 year old African American male with past medical history of insulin dependent diabetes mellitus, hypertension, dyslipidemia, blue coma, benign prosthetic hyperplasia, gastroesophageal reflux disease, end stage renal disease, status post kidney transplant in 2008 with bilateral critical leg ischemia. On the right side, he underwent successful endovascular revascularization with subsequent open transmetatarsal amputation and vac dressing with good wound healing. On the left side, he underwent angioplasty of the left PT, AT, and peroneal arteries on January 16, 2020. But his hallux gangrene progressed into a four-foot gangrene with worsening breast pain. He was offered a left baloney amputation, but he refused, for which he was referred to Dr. Shishibor. These are pictures of his left foot, and as you can see, there is dry gangrene involving the forefoot with skin dryness and no leg edema. Patient underwent non-invasive diagnostic testing and diagnostic angiograms. On the non-invasive diagnostic studies, we can see that this patient has non-compressible blood vessels due to calcification with non-reliable ABI and TBI of zero. Diagnostic angiograms showed patent popliteal artery without any significant disease with 60% stenosis of the TP trunk and two vessels run off to the foot through the AT and PT arteries, and the peroneal artery is occluded at the mid and distal segments. At the level of the foot, we can see that there is no plantar arteries with occluded distal DP and no pedal arch. On February 4th, 2020, we took the patient to the cath lab with the plan to recanalize his pedal arch. We went through a femoral integrate approach and attempted to recanalize his pedal arch through the DP and through the PT arteries without success. Given all this information, what would be your next step? Would you go for a transmetatarsal amputation and hope that it would heal? Or you would go for a baloney amputation? or you would offer the patient a deep venous arterialization, or you would offer him a stem cell therapy. Deep venous arterialization is an option in patients with Rutherford class 5 or 6 critical leg ischemia with no traditional endovascular or open revascularization options. This concept is old, and it was first published by Halstead and Vaughan in 1912. The arterial flow through these venous conduits will increase the reversal of flow, and through the capillaries, it will improve tissue nutrition and possibly stimulate angiogenesis. As we can see in this diagram, the foot has two venous arches, the dorsal venous arch, which drains into the superficial venous system, and the plantar venous arch, which drains into the deep venous system through the posterior tibial and anterior tibial veins. Also, we can see that both venous arches are interconnected with venous tributaries. Deep venous arterialization is a promising option for treating patients with no option critical leg ischemia. In a meta-analysis that was published in 2017, it showed a pooled limb salvage rate at 12 months of 75%. And in the PROMISE international trial, at six months, it showed 60% or higher rates of limb salvage with less than 50% primary patency. So back to our patient, we decided to proceed with endovascular deep venous arterialization. Unfortunately, he did not qualify for the lymph flow trial as he was on immune suppressive therapy for his kidney transplant. So we proceeded with off-the-shelf percutaneous deep venous arterialization. Venous duplex was done and it showed patent venous arch with no evidence of DVT. We started the procedure by inflating a tourniquet around the left thigh and obtaining an ultrasound guided axis of the lateral plantar vein on the plantar aspect of the foot. Then we deflated the tourniquet and obtained anti-grade femoral arterial axis and did selective angiogram of the baloney runoff. Next, we did angioplasty of the distal pop, TP trunk, and proximal PT.
Then we created the AV fistula between the proximal posterior tibial artery and the posterior tibial vein using an inflated balloon in the posterior tibial vein and the outback re-entry device in the arterial side. And we externalized the wire from the venous sheath. Next, we did lysis of the posterior tibial vein valves using balloon angioplasty with different balloons between compliant, non-compliant, and cutting balloons. Initially, we attempted to use the lamethopalvirotome device, but it didn't advance beyond the ankle joint. Then we did venogram to determine our landing zone, followed by stent graft of the entire posterior tibial vein into the posterior tibial artery through the AV fistula. Then we did angioplasty of the lateral plantar vein and the plantar venous arch. Next, we did post-stenting angioplasty, and we found a residual posterior tibial vein valve that was managed successfully with a non-compliant balloon. Then we stented the proximal posterior tibial artery and the TP trunk with a drug eluting stent in overlap with the Vibon stent graft. Completion angiogram showed excellent angiographic result with anti-grade flow into the posterior tibial vein and the plantar venous arch. Patient had an eventful hospital stay and was discharged on the fourth day post-procedure on rivaroxaban, aspirin, and clopidogrel to a long-term acute care facility. His first follow-up was on March 12, 2020, and he had no wrist pain with well-demarcated dry gangrene and patent stent grafts. The volume flow in the lateral plantar vein was 260 cc per minute. The plan is to wait for a total of three months post-procedure prior to transmetatarsal amputation. In conclusion, it's important to know that CLI patients are very sick patients with multiple comorbidities and at high mortality risk. Major amputation increases their morbidity and mortality and early recognition with referral to advocated limb salvage centers with multidisciplinary team result in amputation prevention and reduction in morbidity and mortality. Percutaneous deep venous arterialization is a great option for no option CLI patients with acceptable limb salvage rate.